Welcome to Sarder TV. I'm Jennifer Crumpton, and today I'm talking with Mike Benson, the EVP and CIO of DirecTV. Mike, tell us a little bit about your path to becoming CIO at DirecTV. Well, it really starts um, from when I was in school and going to, to college and got interested in technology because the place I was working while going to school was McDonald's, and at that time they were doing technology. Texas Instrument computers that were in each one of the stores and you basically put all the inventory and the sales in, and then you uploaded that and that fascinated me into that. Wow. So that caused my career to go, love, love business but think more on the technology side. So that started my kind of my four way into IT or technology. From there I, my first job was with a distribution company, did that for seven years. During that time I moved to California the very first time from the state of Washington. So I got to go through a whole transition of moving out of state into a new state and experiencing that and, and the company as well was growing. And so that was great. Then the company was sold one more time to a company called J.R. Simplot in Boise, Idaho and I lived in Monterey. Said, do I want to go to Boise, Idaho or do I want to stay in California or do I want to go back to Washington? And I ended up uh, finding a job um, in Washington and working there for three years, which was great because it then put, uh, parlayed me into a company called Macaw Communications or the Cellular One brand back in the beginning of cellular mm -hmm. industry. Yeah, so this is 1987 one. time frame. And so I was spent um, 17 years there, worked and did some fantastic things. Ran, was a CIO for a business unit within Macaw Communications and then eventually was the CIO for AT&T Wireless for three years from 2000-2003 and then AT&T Wireless was sold to Singular and then I moved on and then all of a sudden I got tapped on the shoulder to go work for this entertainment company in Southern California. So when you hear about entertainment company, you hear, oh that must be Disney because who else is in Southern California? Well there was DirecTV so it's my uh -huh. first uh, into television or in broadcast uh, distribution of pay TV and um, that was in 05 and spent 11 and a half years working for that company and had a great time. Learned a lot, went through two different CEOs and that worked out fantastic and um, was very successful. I think those are the fond years, quite a few years in McCall were fantastic, but the last 11 years have been probably the icing on the cake, as I would say, mm -hmm. for my career and stuff. And, and I've been able to do a lot of things there from developing my organization, putting in some unique capabilities, fearlessly focused on failure um, was one of the big things that we did there. Brought in Agile into the environment, so all our products uh, organization were all under Agile development. Also helped influence how we did product development within the company as a whole. A couple of my leaders moved out of my organization, and took key roles inside of the uh, business organization. So that was pretty, uh, you know, it's pr I'm pretty proud. I'm like a proud parent of, of that organization, so that was kind of <laughs> nice. And who knew this would all start at McDonald's? Right, <laughs> flipping hamburgers, yeah. Who would know that? That's amazing. Yeah. Well, what has been the secret to your success? Each time you, you moved up, you climbed up the ladder, you learned, um, and you moved into higher positions. How did that work for you? How did you navigate that? So probably there were three things that, that um, I'm very passionate about business. So every time I get into a, an organization or company, I really want to understand how the business works mm -hmm. and then have the language of the business as opposed to a more technology, so I'm a technology background, but understanding the business and weighing in on making how the, the direction of the business. So I've been able to do that in, in all the places that I've worked. So that's probably the big mm -hmm. thing. The other one I'm passionate about, um, and I have struggled in my past, but, uh, but I have overcome those struggles, is really be a, uh, more of a people person, mm -hmm. reaching out to the organization, being collaborative with the organization, being transparent within the organization, leading, having fun is a big thing for me. That's another aspect. And the third one is I'm inquisitive. Even when I was a child, I, I took things apart just to try to understand how they worked. <laughs> so when I go into an organization, I really want to understand how it all works. So I want to get deep into the organization, understand how technology is uh, supporting the business, what technology is using, why are we using those. Everything should have a reason why we're mm -hmm. doing those things. So those have been quite a few um, things that have helped me in, in navigate through the, the organization. Had several of my uh, leaders and mentors who I, I supported or reported to me or I reported to them who helped me build that um, portfolio of understanding the business, understand how people uh, are extremely important, um, whether you're in technology or anywhere, they're the ones that drive the companies. 
What do you do in your spare time, if you have any, <laughs> to learn and grow? So a couple things. So in my spare time in my life, I've been able to, so I've, I've directed choirs, um, wow. from children choirs to adult choirs at church. Multi-talented. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's kind of like you're getting out of your comfort zone, right, when you go do something like that. And I realized, you know, I started with doing children's choirs, which was fascinating. And you can see how children don't behave and they, they don't stay focused <laughs> and stuff. Then you do adult choir, that same behavior. So in the adult choirs as well as they are in the children's choirs, it just, they're just a little more mature in how they behave. <laughs> they're just bigger. <laughs> but, but that was one area. Um, another area that helped that I learned how to cook so oh. I, I love cooking. Uh, I'm married to a wonderful wife who's, who's a great chef. Oh, wow. Um, and we love to cook and entertain. We do, once a year, we do what we call a soup party at our home. There are 12 different soups. We invite people in. We have about 110 people who come to these soup parties. Wow. And so it's just soups, some breads, and some wine uh, and beer is kind of the way it goes. And good company. And good That's company. all you yes, need. <laughs> yes. And then on the personal side, I'm, I'm constantly looking to see how I can expand my understanding, whether that is purely a business or motivation mm -hmm. or leadership skills, as well as in technologies. And I've had the opportunity to, to do all those type of things and, and really dig into what's going on in our businesses, mm. whether that's even political side of it as well as mm. normal uh, leadership development. And what role have mentors played in your career and in your life in general? So there's several that, that uh, big mentors that helped ground me. So my first company I worked for, my boss was probably the same age as my father was. And he became a good mentor to me, he grounded me and understand how the business works, especially with your first job out of college, your eyes are wide open, you have perceptions of how things work, and then when reality comes in, you say, well, that's not what I thought it would be yeah. like. And he kind of helped ground us and, and explain to you why what you learn in school, you apply, but, but the real world has a lot of different factors involved mm -hmm. that makes it more interesting and more challenging. So that was a good one. Dallas Purnell was, was his name and he was a great mentor to me. And then I had an, another one who's Steve Elfman was another great uh, mentor leader. He was my boss at AT&T Wireless back in the 90s. Great leader, great motivator, got grounded with them. He also gave me appreciation to wines. A, an side. extra perk. An extra <laughs> perk to that. So he was one. And then my last one, I think Mike White is my last CEO at DirecTV, an excellent leader, understood the importance of technology, um, leveraged my talent, knew what to pull or push to even go further in my career. Mm. So those are probably the three of the biggest ones. What technologies at DirecTV are in the highest demand right now and, and why? So probably the three biggest ones, um, definitely big data, uh, this whole explosion on data and mm. gathering more data, especially with digitalization, uh, which is another technology which is driving more data that you can then use to understand your customers, understand your own organization, what you may need to change and shift within the business. So big data has played a huge role. Mm. Ad advertising, getting the data from back to the advertisers on who watched what advertising mm. is very powerful and has opportunity to generate great revenue for the, for the company. So that's probably the one. Digital side, we're moving more and more to digital more and more technologies that were traditionally you had a, a call center agent or mm. a sales agent. Now you can buy and sell a tablet or a mobile device or a desktop, right, or, is a big one. And then leveraging that digital to be even further where you create public APIs or technologies that, that other people can then take those public APIs, tweak them and enhance them and, and even do more with your product. Mm. So in direct TV space, that would be like, I have APIs that tell you what channels, what we call guide, you can go to. You can make that a public one and then somebody else can take that and say, well, here's all the stuff on DirecTV and here's all the stuff on Hulu and here's all the stuff on Netflix and kind of put together an ecosystem that allows a consumer to then traverse all of these and determine where, what show and where he should go to get that show or that movie mm -hmm. and things. So that's kind of a neat uh, area for Amazing. us. And then the last one is all about how do you become speed, how do you become agile, how do you become faster. So it starts with agile, it starts with cloud, it starts with mobility, it also starts with a fundamental mind shift of your organization mm. that needs to think about, we need to think faster, speed, agility. And speed and agility is the velocity of capabilities you can give to the business that either generates revenue or reduces cost. Mm are the things how we measure that, more than saying I did this many releases or I did this many sprints and stuff from an Agile okay. perspective. 
I loved an article in Forbes uh, where you were interviewed and you said there's not a single thing that the business can do without IT being involved. Unpack that for us. Tell us about IT's central role. At DirecTV, any time that you as a consumer wanted to buy DirecTV services, add new channels, maybe you want Showtime or HBO, or you want to see a fight, or you want to see the NFL, there is technology behind that. And we, from an IT perspective, provision that technology. What we do has a big impact on revenue and touches mm -hmm. the end customer. Yeah. And so that's probably where I say there's nothing they can do. And the interesting part why I made that comment was I had a boss, my first boss at DirecTV was uh, Chase Carey. And Chase came from the Fox uh, News Corp uh, company. That's who acquired DirecTV way back in, in 2004, 2004. And he came on board and was a CEO. Well, at Fox, when he wants to put on a Super Bowl or an all-star game, baseball game, there's no IT technology for him. He can go do that without having technology mm. from that. And so when he came to DirecTV and he, he thought he could do similar things, he didn't know he needed technology. Uh -huh. So it was very um, interesting. One thing is he hired me was a good thing because there were some times when he might have been a little frustrated and you want to be hired by the person who's frustrated with you as opposed to being uh, you're an incumbent or something. So what's mm -hmm. very powerful to that is that it's easy to sh demonstrate to our customers, whether that's our business partners or the end customer consumer, how technology enables the services. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it from the IT organization, the technology organization, it's not hard to motivate an individual who's writing code or supporting from an operation perspective how what they're doing has a huge impact on oh, our customers. Yeah. So it's very That's powerful and, it, and it's very m motivating. Tell us how you use technology to increase revenue and improve your operations. So where we used um, technology to improve revenue was, this is probably 2006 and I had a conversation with the CEO and he wanted to give the capabilities to our dealers to sell programming packages and up until that time you sold the hardware and then you had to call in to get what programming package you wanted. I thought this would be easy and I went at it saying that's not a problem Chase it'll be no problem I'll be able to do this really easily and then I realized well there are nine different systems that sell DirecTV services and we're trying to figure out how can we put new offers in to all those nine systems and consistently do it so that all systems do exactly the same. Mm. So we created this whole offer management solution that allowed them to do that and make it very quickly. And where the proof really came was there was a time when our competitor decided to offer free HD and we heard about it like the first of June and I was asked how quickly could we create the same type of offer and put it into the marketplace and we were able to do it in three days. Oh wow. Which is very powerful and very impressive to the organization. Oh my so, so that's one place where we're going to help generate revenue and we can yeah. continue to grow that. The other place how we improve the operations is we brought some technology to the business It's called a decision engine that basically says we look at what the best next action we should do for an individual. So when you call into a call center or you go onto a website, you want to do something. You're, you're either calling about your bill or you're calling about services. And we want to know from the use of big data and some other capabilities how we can tee up and tell the call center agent that you are looking for X. This might be a new offer. That way it made it more efficient than the agents trying to hunt and, and understand what the customer really wants. So we were able to use some technology with some big data and serve up to our customers or our agents or to a website. Here's what we believe to be the next, next best action. And it's, you know, it's about 80% accurate, it's not 100% accurate. But that's a place we've got more efficiency in the call centers. We've also been able to control our cost or our spend um, with our business partners. So that's another place we've used it. What are the challenges of information technology today and how do you overcome them? Probably the biggest challenge for technology in, in today's world, and, and this will evolve over time, is really about speed. It's really about delivering capabilities to the business mm -hmm. at the time they need them or in some cases ahead of them. If we could just meet that every time some of our business partners wanted something we could deliver it in, in a really acceptable, and I mean truly acceptable time frame that was their speed. So agile and speed is, speed and velocity are probably the biggest 
challenge within technology. The next one, and I think they're both, is the language we use. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency in technology to talk in terms that our business partners don't really understand. <laughs> and that builds this kind of wall. So we need to break down that barrier. We need to put everything we do in terminology that the business understands. Mm -hmm. That when they're looking for something, we're late, we can explain to them why we might be late on a capability in their terms, not mm -hmm. in the technology terms. And that's a challenging one. Yeah. And the third one is, within technology, and it's growing up, there's this us versus them mentality. When mm -hmm. you bring together a whole bunch of technology people together into a forum, you know, lots of times you can say, well, our business partners won't want to do this and don't want to do that. We need to change that language. You, mm -hmm. you are part of that business, you're part of the company that you work in. We should stop blaming our business partners or our, our company and people on our challenges. Technology mm -hmm. has its challenges, but we should be more transparent to that. We should be proactive complaining to each other why things don't work doesn't really help. Yeah. Right? We need to look for solutions to improve that delivery, improve that delivering capabilities, make it as seamless as possible. Mm -hmm. And technology companies need to make it easier for doing, implementing and adopting technology. You know, you get all these great advertising yeah. out there, whether yeah. that's HP or IBM or anybody come out with how it's easy to do things. They're not easy. They're sometimes hard to do, and we have to make them more transparent and easy to use. Mm -hmm. Tell us about a time, and you've alluded to several, but is there a specific example you'd like to talk about when you identified a serious problem and technology was used as the solution? So yeah, probably the, the one we did, our direct sales organization was looking for, they were using 17 different systems to make a sale. Mm. And so we looked at identifying a technology to go do that. This whole journey we went on and it was a journey had its challenges so we brought in a, a third party to come and help us that solution didn't work after six months we figured out this wasn't going to work we then said okay we're going to try to do it ourselves we spent another year it didn't work and the third one finally worked and what was the difference between all three of those one we let the vendor do we thought we'll hand it off to the vendor and they'll do it and we didn't have a lot of involvement the second one, we didn't understand our business partners well enough and understand mm -hmm. what they were trying to do, and mm -hmm. that's why that one failed. And the third one, why it was successful, is because we sat down with the end individual who's going to use this capability to understand how they do what they do today. Because before, we were trying to go through these layers of organizations and understanding. Mm -hmm. So we identified a solution, we called our direct sales solution that allowed our direct sales organization to get rid of the 13 applications and do it almost all of it in one application seamlessly, wow. reduce handle time, improve the call experience, put some workflows in it so the scripting was automatic there as well. So that's probably one of the biggest ones. But it took us three times to do that. Wow. And from that, we also learned that it's okay to fail as long as you fail quickly, fail forward, fail fast, and, and don't be afraid of failure. Most people are afraid of failure. Yeah. How important is mobility for DirecTV's success? Well, extremely important. As you can see, we just got acquired by AT&T. The biggest emphasis there is be able to take that mobility customers and marry it with our DirecTV services and be able to stream content on a mobile device, whether that's a phone, a smartphone, a tablet, or whatever, and that you could take it with you. And they could see that we had that type of technology and capability. That's why they acquired DirecTV, and you can see that today if you subscribe to NFL Sunday Ticket and you're watching a football game and then let's say your significant other says, can you go to the grocery store or go somewhere and do something, you can watch the games on your mobile device, um, which is very powerful. So that whole mobility side, and you're going to see this more and more content being pushed out into the mobile space, whether that's video from, from a pay TV or other types of video and stuff. So that's becoming more and more powerful, and I think people are embracing that big time. How do you use big data to promote development and to support your IT projects? We went into big data a little cautiously. We wanted mm -hmm. to prove that big data could provide value to the business or the organization. So we didn't buy a whole bunch of you know, big data capabilities and start bringing all this data in not knowing how we're going to use it. So we were more prescriptive in how we wanted to go use it. And so we identified places where we could use the big data to help us improve uh, our performance and stuff. 
And internally within IT, we used it from whether that is data that we're getting from our websites and all the web pages to understand are the flows and how the website's working to the level it should be, or do we need to help tweak it? Because the one thing about digital, and especially to your end customers, your end customer won't necessarily tell you your website's not working. Right. They'll just leave. So you really <laughs> got to understand why. Yeah. And so big data's helped us do that internally as identify that. And there's some capabilities out there that allow you to look at going through all the tree structures within a website and making sure they're working correctly. And mm -hmm. if somebody abandons your shopping cart, why they abandon the shopping cart. So you get more analysis. Mm -hmm. so you can provide to this sales organization that's managing that as well as your own internally to see if do I have any flaws in my technology. How do you define the role of a CIO? When I look at the CIO role, I wear many hats, so, and so there's many leadership hats, and so I'll start with the first one I think is the most important, being a CIO, and that's being a leader at the table with your peers, so the C-suite. So if, you're, if you report into that and you're at the table, you, your leadership should be how do you help move the company forward, as well as the things that that leadership team do, they do as one team, I call it a first team. And what that means is that this first team is here to help support the company as a whole to grow. That may mean that within my functional area that I support for that leadership team, I may have to do things that um, are more taxing or not the best thing to do. But you're doing that for the first team because you're trying to move the whole organization mm -hmm. along. So this whole first team concept then drives down to my direct reports, mm -hmm. report to me, and one may be in development, one may be in infrastructure, maybe in strategy and stuff. That first team all have to work as one and leave their functional hats aside when they talk about our challenges within technology, the same thing as the challenges of the business. So there's a leadership role that's really about leading the company or leading an organization. So that's one level. The next level is now, I'm the now I am the CIO and the leader at the technology level. So now I have to lead and set a direction to the organization to help support the business strategy and drive that goals and that strategy. And so I set the direction, set the strategy, and make sure I get alignment and buy-in on that. And, and I don't do it all by myself. I got the leadership to help develop that and drive that. So that's a different type of leadership skill. And it's also pushing it down within the organization. And what I've learned probably more recently is leadership's at every level in the organization. Whether I'm an individual contributor, I'm a leader of some aspects of it. I'm leading the cause for the organization. I'm a, so I need to have that buy-in and I need to be visible from a leader all the way down to an individual contributor. And being visible also means I may call you up and you may have done one wonderful thing. I'll just call you up and say, I want to thank you for what you've done. I didn't know how powerful that was until maybe three or four years ago when you start doing that more and more mm -hmm. and the organization just grows and blossoms in that. And just the stories that carry on, just the motivation just improves. And the motivation that improves, then the capacity and the availability and, and the things that we do are a lot better. Mm -hmm. So that's a piece of it. And the last one is technology. Leadership from what are the right technologies should we be using to support our business? Because when you get the technology, there may be four different flavors, whether that's from an IBM, an HP, a, a Oracle, or Salesforce, and you have to determine and navigate what's the best technology that fits you, organization, and you. And both may work, it's just one, how would one fit better than another one? It'd be like mm -hmm. a, this glove fits better than that glove, even though they're exactly the same, they yeah. function the same way. So. What's your leadership style? I mean, clearly, you are very motivating and you understand how thinking people um, really sparks something. But tell me about your leadership style on a day-to-day -day basis. What does that look like? So I guess my leadership style would be, first and foremost, I, in my organization, empower my leadership. So I'm definitely, from an empowerment perspective, I push down decision-making as far as I can, mm. and I encourage that. My goal in that space is to make sure I have clear goals, clear expectations, everybody understands that the goals can't be interpreted three or four different ways mm -hmm. that you make them clear. That means for myself, driving those goals down and asking questions, does everybody understand the goal, anybody have any questions about it, and driving that consistency aspect of it. So that's important. People are the most important things. I've spent a lot of time developing my leadership and trying to develop further in the organization. I've done quite a few exercises through Patrick Lincioni's books, Five Dysfunctions of a Team would be one example of that, mm -hmm. that we've used that to help the team. So I'm big in people, because 
even though you've got some great technology, the technology doesn't become successful or alive without the people. Mm. So I'm very much a people person. I can get detail oriented if you ask any of my colleagues or uh, anybody where I ask a lot of questions and I ask those questions just to better understand uh, what we're trying to do and stuff. So I can be in some cases very detail oriented and, and, and questions and I'll do that when I'm probably more in, in stress than not. When there's a crisis I'll drive down and ask, ask a lot more questions, so that aspect of it. I like having fun um, f because you're working 12 hours, some people are working longer than 12 hours. You need to make sure the environment you're in is to have so, you know, you're work, working hard, but you have to have fun. Yeah. And fun can be, we do celebrations for when we can do enterprise, our enterprise releases all the time. We'll, we'll celebrate birthday parties, we'll celebrate just events that go on. We'll celebrate teams, um, be actively involved uh, in the organization is what I'm, probably my motto. And the nice thing I think I've gotten from, God gave me one thing, I can sing. If, if I had a tenor's voice, I may not be doing what I was doing today. I'd probably be <laughs> professionally singer, but wow. all I have is a baritone voice. So I, I sing a lot. And in fact, when I first went to direct TV, the two days after there, there was somebody's having a birthday, and there's 40 people in a room, and I sing <laughs> happy birthday, and they're all wondering, what the heck is this guy doing? I love it. That's so I, I'm highly motivated on that whole people and the leadership side of it. Tell us a little bit about your 12-step recovery program that you developed um, to really lead teams through the fear of failure. So we did this back, I think, in 2012. Um, the motivation for putting this uh, fearlessly focus on failure, which we called F12, because there's a like a 12-step program where there was AA kind of a mentality. Okay. And the purpose for that was we're doing some projects that were having challenges, and when projects run into difficulties, look like they're going to fail, the typical teams that are working on that the first thing they do is to figure out how they make sure it's not their problem, mm -hmm. which is um, yeah. not helping us get through the problem, not helping us figure it out. So we wanted to be willing to instill into the organization this concept that if they see things that don't look like they're going the right way, or you think that we may fail in this, to raise your hand. Raise mm -hmm. your hand and say, I think we might be going down this failure. And then let's have a discussion about that, and we may alter and adjust project initiatives. So that's the concept. We then, how are we going to communicate this, fiercely focus on failure, further down the organization, and not make this a one event, but a cultural shift, a cultural change in the organization. So we did several things. We made sure that my leadership team were all bought in on, that we all agree that we need to get rid of this fear of failing, fail quickly, fail forward, fail fast, shift, identify problems, shift and move. And that took a little while to get that buy-in, truly buy-in to everybody, they, they walk the talk. We then figured out so how we communicate that down. We looked at several different mechanisms for doing that, whether we were doing our own teachable point of views on organization and things to the point where we got to gamify it. We decided we were going to gamify mm -hmm. this. And we built this game to allow people to walk through and see where we failed in the past and what we did to solve those failures. So we created these failure vaults. So these are things that we failed in So you can go out and look at. We also created a success vault, too, that showed you where we were successful. We created things that people go in, they get points by looking at videos or, and taking a small a quiz on it, and then the point people got rewarded for that, whether that was if you're the leader for the month, you might get a tablet. Um, you might get, we had the wrestling belt, you know, like you see on WWE, <laughs> that you got to carry around for a quarter or if you're the <laughs> quarter leader, but we motivated them from that perspective. That was our first year into our program. The second year, we decided we wanted to push this whole idea of leadership down to every level. So we identified 75 to 80 people that we would put them through a intense learning uh, on the success of a CIO. And there's a book out that Harvard has that talks about the journey of a CIO leader. And we decided we were going to do this teaching in a case study format. So I took all my leaders and myself and we were going to be the lead, the professors in the case study. So all we had to learn how to do case studies which made us all a little nervous and here you're outside your comfort zone again so you're trying to learn something brand new and then we identified the 75 people and we each all had seven people I think that's how we did this seven people that we then mentored once uh, and brought into a case study class once every other month that's how we did it and then they had to do a report out we did that for well over a year I first thought it was a year but I was informed a few months back that said no Mike this was really more like 18 months and we went through all this, this program oh. so we drove that whole learning 
aspect. So now we have 75, think of it 75 to 80 lieutenants out there who, who are passionate about learning and passionate about learning about to fail, fail quickly, fail forward, fail fast, to populate into the organization. That's pretty powerful. Yeah. So this whole program, and I truly believe that you constantly need to look at how you take your organization and make them a learning organization. You need to continue to grow and expand and develop, especially in two areas. One, in technology, because technology is constantly changing and mm -hmm. shifting, and you need to have that. Well, so is a business. So if you yeah. go back and look at DirecTV, and, and, and if we sit here in, in 2006, 2007, we weren't thinking about mobility, we weren't right. thinking about digital. Yeah. All of a sudden, they come out with, a, with smartphones, and all of a sudden, you got this mobility. So you've got to shift that, that side of it too. And then the business changes, so you have to understand the business. You constantly have to learn and shift and adjust. Mm -hmm. I'm a big proponent for, I may have a leadership style or a way of going about doing things. And over my career, that has to shift because mm -hmm. what I knew in 1975 is totally different than what I know in 1996 and it's totally different than in 2016. Mm -hmm. And therefore you need to, you, the same way of doing things, you have to shift and you have to learn new capabilities, new skill sets, where that's learning new skill sets that you're bringing millennials in. And the way millennials work is differently than what a baby boomer, who I am, yeah. would work. And yeah. so you have to adopt and shift and, and do those things. This whole F12 is underlining a learning organization. That's what we're driving for. How do you encourage innovation in your team? Innovation is interesting, because people always look at innovation being Here's the next big thing that you did. Look at what yeah. it was very innovative and stuff. And there are some of those, right? But they're more rare than the little ones. The little ones are just incremental ways of improving the business or improving your processes or improving technology or improving an application that are innovative, some new idea of doing things. So we, we drive that through the organization as a concept that says everyone, so it's not one organization does innovation, it's everyone participates in innovation. So we've done lots of different ways to motivate that. First one we did because I work for a paid TV company. It's not hard for me to get into a studio and do a Shark Tank and do a Shark ah. Tank on <laughs> seven innovative ideas that our business that our our employees were wearing. Okay. So we did that, and they brought up seven of them, and we then voted on one just like the same thing with a Shark Tank, and then we gave them funding. It wasn't a lot of you know like a hundred thousand dollars to go figure out what they could go do with that. That's a way of motivating. That's very it, it innovative works real well. way. Yeah, of and, and it works real well because innovation. we have the technology to go do that. I have a studio. <laughs> I have everything that's capable of doing those type of things. But that's one area that we drive in. We also then look at what new learnings do we need to have. So design thinking. So we went to Stanford. We took several people and went to Stanford to learn about design thinking, and then we evangelized des design thinking within the organization. Mm -hmm. So that helps foster that, yeah. and and it has to be visible. You have to be talking about how we can think about innovating the company and innovating new things. Mm -hmm. Google does a great job of that, right? One, Google's successful just based on their search engine, and that search engine fuels all the other things that they failed lots of times on, but they continue to look at innovating. And they'll strike new deals and some things they won't, but that mentality and that drive has to start from the top down and push in the organization. Mm. And I'm fortunate enough to work in the size of organization that I don't need to go ask for permission from my boss to go look at these things. I have mm. a fairly large enough budget. Yeah. I know how to manage that budget. I know how I can start using some of those expenses and I can get buy-in in the organization. We need to drive that. We can go do that. So, nice. But innovation is extremely important. How do you find the right people for your IT team? That's a very difficult one. Um, hiring is a challenge. I think in some cases you're betting on somebody, you bring in and think, oh, this person's bright mm -hmm. and works well, and when they get in the organization, the organization, they don't fit. Mm -hmm. So you, you gotta look at lots of aspects of that, depending on the level that you're hiring for. If you're hiring for a leader, the team dynamics are probably one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. How well does this person fit into your organization? They don't have to all look alike, but they have to complement, and they also have to work well together. So I've been successful in doing some of those, and some of them I've had, I brought somebody in, and, and I was really high on this person. The person was smart, energetic, and brought a lot of value to us, but didn't gel well enough mm -hmm. in the organization. Right. So that's a challenge. Skill sets, do they have the right skill sets? For an example I will use is project management. I could be a project manager managing a small remodel of a house versus I've project managed $50 million enterprise. They're both called project managers, but the person that's doing the $50 million has more skills and breadth and understanding than the one that's just doing a, a small remodel of a house, right, and has a handful of people. 
So project management is very challenging to find mm -hmm. the right person. It has mm -hmm. to do with a understanding the discipline, you have to have a good relationship and how to build relationships and collaborate and be transparent are aspects of it, as well as just the fundamental, you know, how you run a project and, and work well. So they're a challenge. The skills mm -hmm. are, they're really hard to find and get good talent. And so I, my goal is, can I develop new people and then feed the organization with younger people and can we constantly do that? Interns is a perfect example of that. We bring in a lot of interns. We'll bring about 30 to 50 interns in a year. We will decide, here are five that I want to keep. And so we try to see if we can keep them through the whole year. Some we can't, some can't because they go to school on the East Coast and we're on the West Coast. But we try to look at feeding our pipeline with interns because interns are a good place mm -hmm. to get them started with, and get them buy-in on the culture and, the sh and how we run our organization and our company and stuff is one area that, uh, that I'm very big on from an intern perspective. And we're actively working in the colleges and the communities and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the skills are hard, I mean, and you can see that today. It's hard to find technology people. That's why you've got a lot going out, your offshore stuff mm -hmm. to places like India or China, Vietnam, other areas, because the skills and the education programs aren't as, are not producing that many people in the technology space, which they should be doing. Are young people actually being educated well about the skills that you need for IT? Um, are we producing people with the right skills from our education system and encouraging people to pursue this type of work? I could have two answers to that. One, I would say, I think we're educating them on the technologies and new technologies. I think they're learning a lot. I mean, you know, I can go take my 10-year-old grandson who knows how to use my <laughs> iPhone and iPad and he knew it when he was six and he knew my password. So he's more <laughs> adapt to understanding and grabbing a whole new technology and going with that. And so I think that background and stuff is a foundation for people learning technology and want to get in that space. And so I think we are. The part that we may not really appreciate and understand is, is business companies wanting to learn from the millennials on approach of technology. Mm. I think I do see that and worry about those aspects of it. Mm. Time will tell, I think, because I have a belief that eventually, and I don't know when this is, this is my lifetime or next, is that technology will, will be just a part of the fabric of a business and you won't be able to necessarily s see it. Yeah. It'll just be, it'll be there, right? It'll be just part of that fabric. How do you go about building a successful team culture? It's hard. To me, I think the leader has to drive that and, and participate and, and work, spend most of his time trying to build that culture, build that teamwork, and that leadership, and demonstrate it. And then when you see misbehavior of that, call it out, mm. solve that problem. Because if you don't solve that problem and you let it go, there are people watching from the sidelines looking in and saying, well, he really doesn't, you know, mm. he's not taking care of that problem. So if you have an individual in the organization that's disruptive and not, you need to deal with it. Even though that person may do a great job, this is back to, I deliver great results, I can get projects done on time, under budget and everything, but you know, I, I massacre the team that's working on it or something right. like that, right? So you've got to say, I don't need that for the long term, I don't need that. So you've got to figure out how you call those people out and pull them out. So I think the leaders have to be actively involved in this whole leading team. I believe in reaching out to the employees and, and giving them high fives on things they accomplished. I think that goes a long ways. Um, I think this whole idea of innovation, fear of failure, if you can get that fear of failure out of the way, mm -hmm. you can build a great organization that can even do more than what it could do before with, with the same amount of people or even less people. Because you've, you've gotten rid of barriers, you got them to be not afraid to ask questions, to be as transparent and up and down the organization as possible. Why do you think it's important for the CIO and the CEO to have a really good relationship? And how do they those two roles work together to create success. The, having that relationship with the CEO to me is, is extremely important because I have the ability to help influence how we could even leverage more technology into the business. Mm -hmm. I also like to have a great relationship with the CEO to really understand because he can see things that might be flaws of mine and, and, and having enough courage because it is courage to say okay you know, okay, Mike, what do you think is m my challenges? And, and, and being open to hearing those and adjusting. So that, that's important to me because that relationship I have with him, there are seven other people that I support that are my peers 
who may have a little different view and how they're going to vent those views or communicate those views is back to the CEO, not mm. necessarily to me. Because oh, right. most people don't like conflict, right? Conflict's not the best thing, so that's important to me. I think the other thing that's important to me, and again, it's back to we work a lot of hours. If you can create this into a friendship, if you can create this into whether it's just, you know, I trust a trusting friendship, trusting person, it's extremely important and very valuable to us. And I think I have that with uh, Mike White, who was, was the C uh, CEO of DirecTV. And so that's been valuable to me. It also, it's back to Technology is hard. Remember when I talked at the beginning, it's hard and how we put it in, in the right terms and sometimes it's, even when you've done that, I still don't get it. If I continue building a better rapport with he or she who's the CEO and I can explain my, and I have to explain maybe several, several times, that's important and, and that's what will make a great leader. Um, it's hard. Um, not everybody's up to it. Um, mm -hmm. The CEOs may not want to deal with the complexities, so it's incumbent upon the CIO to make it less about comp simplify it if you can the best way you can simplify it because you know we have a tendency to, to explain a problem so that, that it's you know it's so complicated <laughs> that their head hurts and they then give up on it right. Right? so that's a challenge <laughs> yeah. and, and so but I'm very big on reporting to the the CEO and not everybody does and if you don't then can you build a great relationship with your boss, whoever whether that's a CFO or the COO and then do you still get connections back to the CEO are important and are you really at the table? If you're not at the table, it's really hard. Mm. Mike, thank you so much for being with us today. This is Sarder TV. I'm Jennifer Crumpton. Thanks so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.